dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. Whether we're leading a family or a business, all leaders have to do things they don't want to do. As soon as we assume the mantle of leadership, we assume the mantle of facing things that could hurt us, that could take valuable time away, valuable resources away, or even inflict pain at different levels of our life. This means that leaders have to be brave. St. Thomas Aquinas describes the virtue of bravery as fortitude, and this third of the cardinal virtues is what we are focusing on today. Welcome back to the St. John Leadership Network, everybody. I am really excited to be able to present to you on Fortitude today. This is the fifth of our series on the virtuous leader. Now, as we've been doing these classes, something that's really struck me is the difference between this classical view of human actions and the typical message anyway that we're getting from our you know, just general modern culture. It's rare to hear speak of virtue today and to hear it upheld as if it was really a goal. And I started to think, well, why is that the case? Why wouldn't something so beautiful and so clear and so helpful and also with so and so many roots in antiquity and in the thought that precedes us, why wouldn't this be upheld? And it goes hand in hand, I think, with the uh, inability of the modern mind to affirm truth with certitude. This is a, a problem that we see across the board that a typical modern person and, and you know, a, someone who's, in other words, schooled in the modern way of thinking has an aversion to affirming something as absolutely true. Whereas the ancients claimed the, the, the ability to know the truth as the be- starting point for discussion, we today want it to make the end point of discussion. If we have enough discussions, then maybe we'll affirm something as something that we all agree on as a consensus instead of saying, you know what, this is the truth about our human life. And where this has a big impact, of course, is when we're defining what the purpose of our human life is. The, you know, for Aristotle, the peripatetic school, you, you, would, you would at least make a stab at it. You know, you'd say, I think that at least life is about money or life is about pleasure or life is about happiness or the the nature of a spiritual good or life is about contemplating God. And and, and taking a stab at it, you'd then be able to create a construct that was worthy of dialogue. Is this or that correct? If in fact, happiness is found in the contemplation of God, well, then the greatness of our humanity will be in our ability to, to reach that contemplation. And there are certain virtues, therefore, that are higher than others and certain dangers that need to be avoided more than others. And you would be able to create what's called an ethics. Uh, Today, it's rare that you find someone speaking about ethics in a way or in a sense that has any of the, the absolute or at least the certitude that the ancient mind demonstrated, at least in this particular school, the school of Aristotle. Now, of course, there's a certain advantage to skepticism. There's an adva- there's advantages to everything. But in, when you don't know why you're alive, you can't then find the way that you should live. This is the key message. If you want to have a guide for how you should live, a guide for your actions towards what's right and what's wrong, and what's the best way to develop yourself and what's the, the, the greatest threat to that development, you need to have a, a way of targeting accurately the end goal of your actions. And this requires the, the mind's ability to latch onto something, to affirm something as if it was true. And so to the degree that you find yourself in a skeptical spot, and, and many of this, much of this skepticism isn't theoretical today, it's just practical. We look around and we say, you know, how, how can I really be sure? 
There are so many religions out there, right? For example, that say so many different things. And there are so many competing philosophies out there that wh who is to say who's right and who's wrong? Well, I mean, on the one hand, you, you might be right. There's a lot of opinions out there. But on the other hand, if it keeps you back from affirming in, a, in an assertive fashion what it is that you believe in, and, and so that you can define it and talk about it and understand it and apply it in your life, well, then it's also keeping you back from something that's essential for not only your personal happiness, but also the happiness of everyone that you lead. You're like a blind person simply saying there's too much light. And so I can't see anything. I've been blinded by the light, right? Well, the, that's really not, that's not acceptable in a sense because when you're leading, you have to be able to have that vision for where you're taking the people who are underneath you, your family, etc. And if you don't have that vision, it will be set by the strongest voice in the crowd. We live in a, a world today that's bereft of intelligent leadership because we have replaced that intelligent leadership with the might of power. And whoever it is that wields uh, and influences public opinion according to their fashion holds the sway over, over the minds and actions of, of so many people. And the only thing to free that, that quest from power is truth. Let me put it this way for you. My inability to claim anything with intellectual certitude will mean that I will affirm everything with practical certitude. Okay, Th this is the real problem. Someone is always leading. If it's not going to be the truth and my claim to it, it's going to be someone else's claim to truth. And if everyone mutually agrees that we can't find truth about human actions and what we're doing and we just accept a type of skepticism towards everything, well, we're still going to have a truth claim. There's going to be something that's leading the way that we approach the world. And typically that's going to be whoever holds the greatest influence over the opinion of the crowd to which I belong. And I just think that there's something greater. There's a deeper way to live. And when, especially if you have a deep sense of responsibility for the people to, you know, who have been entrusted to you, your children, you know, your spouse, et cetera, like you need to fight for these people. Well, what are we going to fight with? What are we going to fight for? We're going to fight with the vision that Jesus Christ gives us in God's holy word, the Bible, for example. And we're going to fight for the truth of the humanity that that vision lays out. It's a humanity that says that every one of us was created for God and that we were created for greatness. Now, just remember, greatness is not something that's quantifiable in this term, right? See, St. Augustine puts it this way. He says, when you're not talking about things that are great in terms of size, to be great is to be good. So you can understand if we don't understand what good is or we can't define goodness with a certainty of truth, well, then we won't be able to either achieve greatness. We won't, as you define goodness, so you define greatness. If you define the, the, what it means to really be human, then you can really achieve that goal by becoming that great human that you want to be. And this becomes the goal of our life. So beware of a culture that, that, that says it's impossible to know what the good is and that we just have to accept that there's so many answers, which means that there's basically no answer, that no one can really be certain. You just have to choose the one that, that, that strikes your fancy at the particular moment. Because even if that might be a, an option to do that, it's an option that doesn't allow you to lead. You're just saying everybody has to choose their own good. Well, that, that's kind of silly just as real as you are, right? And as real as your person is, so also is the realism that there is a goal to attain for that person. You can't pretend that because a person thinks this is the good way to act, it is. <laughs> just think of that. Everyone defines for themselves, this is how I'm supposed to be. Well, uh, that's, that's to assume that everyone is supposed to be the person who defines reality in their own terms. Well, this, as we know, simply cannot be. It's not because I wish to be a certain way that in fact I am. 
In order for me to actually be good, I have to know who I am. And this is the genius of going through this study of the virtues with St. Thomas Aquinas because he assumes not the relativism of the skeptic mind today, but the, the innocent realism of the ancient mind to be able to say, in fact, I do look for what is objectively true as the goal that will allow me to achieve happiness and bring those that I lead into their own greater happiness as well. Would you like to hear more from Father Nathan? Join the St. John Leadership Network and receive a two-minute glance at the gospel every Sunday morning right to your phone. To learn more, go to www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org slash member and join for free today. So St. Thomas Aquinas was, uh, you know, he lived in the 13th century. He did a lot of work uh, to try to understand the Bible in the light of the Catholic tradition, right? To try to look at all the saints and everybody who went before. Remember, St. Thomas Aquinas is before the Protestant Reformation of the 15th or the 16th century. So St. Thomas Aquinas was 300 years before the Protestant Reformation. And so for him, looking at the Bible in, the, in terms of Catholic history means looking at the Bible in terms of, of the only history that there was and looking at the, what the saints and the fathers of the church and these great thinkers had to say about the Bible. And he lays out a whole vision for virtue in this light, trying to say, what does the Bible teach us about the human being himself, right? What, what, who are we and what were we made for? So Aquinas answers this question by, by saying, we were made for God and we were made for friendship with each other, for friendship with God, so to speak, or relationship with God and contemplation. And then in, in a, a correct living out of that, and especially finding happiness through this relationship we have with other people as well. And so both of those goods he defines as spiritual goods. They're, meaning they're, they're in the body, of course, like you contemplate God by living as a hermit, by studying truth, by a offering acts of sacrifice. And you live in friendship with your fellow human being by gi giving gifts, by spending time, by, you know, by, by sharing a life with that person. All right, so to a degree, one degree or the other, as is appropriate. But in, in those actions, he, gets, he says, something has to be operative. Your mind has to grasp the truth that's known to it and then conform your actions to that truth. This is the great struggle of virtue. That as I know, for example, that my friend, you know, really needs me to be there for them. And yet I look at the fact that that's going to mean that I have to buy a plane ticket and that plane ticket to go and be with them is going to cost me a lot of money, which means I'm going to have to sacrifice in order to spend time with my friend. I need a virtue that's going to enable me to endure the hit my bank account is going to take so that I can go and be with my friend. That virtue is called fortitude. In the same way as if you think of a, of, of a relationship with God and I really want to offer a sacrifice to God, but at the same time, I have a hard time sacrificing my time for him because there's always some other bright and shiny object that's attracting my attention. I need the virtue of temperance to temper my desires for what is easy and what is close to me in order for me to really hit that goal. of If I, if I know I'm supposed to, in other words, pray, nothing else should distract me. The, the, the distraction that comes for, you know, from our time of prayer is a lack of temperance. It's that we go after whatever is immediate and in front of us instead of what we should be going after. Well, in the same way, my human action needs to have that conformity to it of the strength against things that hurt. And that strength is the virtue of fortitude. So now place this in the perspective of every one of your, your, your strivings for things that are authentically good. 
right? So ultimately everything hinges upon the human being's quest for God. And we recognize that the very first place where that quest for God is lived out is in our relationship with our spouse, if we have one, or our families, if we have you know children, but at least in our extended families. And then of course, in our close friendships, and then moving out and, and basically in proximate circles from the center, which is God, through our spouse, through our family, we then extend through our working relationships and the other relationships that form those of our civil society or the other groups that we belong to. Right? This type of order of human actions according to importance is all connected. And in a truly integrated person, everything that they do flows from their connection to God and serves that connection to God. And therefore it flows from their connection to their family and serves that connection to the family. So in other words, if you think of your life as a series of circles, almost like going into the bullseye, the bullseye is your relationship with God. The next circle out is your relationship with your family. The next circle out is your relationship with your colleagues or those with whom you spend a lot of time. The next circle out is your relationship with other kinds of groups. And they're all integrated and unified by that quest that you have for the inner circle. What this means concretely for every one of you is that you are never far away from meaning and purpose and actions that actually improve who you are. You're never far away from deep human development. No matter what goes on in your life, if in fact it flows in the correct order, I am living in a world in order to provide myself with the ability to work. And I am working in order to provide for my family. And I'm living in my family as an expression of my friendship with my spouse. And I live that friendship with my spouse in the service of the Most High God. It just sounds wonderful, right? It's like, what an ordered life. What a wonderful way to live. This is the way we're supposed to live. And most of us today have everything so segmented, we don't even know who we are. And we, we float through life without knowing our identity because we don't know our purpose. Christianity comes in and Jesus announces our purpose for us. We're to live in his service, following him in a sacrifice to the Father. And therefore, we, we assume our vocations in life as a gift to him. And our vocations in life require from us integration into society and human labor. And so we, we accept those things in order to glorify him in and through our families. You see all this, what a wonderful vision. And what, what does that allow us to do? It allows us to then make choices and to both persevere through hard things and temper easy things in order to hit that goal, which is preserving my relationship with God in Jesus Christ. That's where the life of virtues really shines, especially the virtue of fortitude. Would you like to start your Thursday mornings with a scriptural leadership lesson? Join the St. John Leadership Network, where Father Nathan hosts a 30-minute call at 6.30 a.m. in all four U.S. time zones. To learn more, go to www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org slash member and join for free today. So what is this virtue of fortitude that St. Thomas Aquinas talks about, right? He defines it as our ability to remove any obstacle that withdraws the will from following the reason. And he goes on to say that it can be taken in two ways. First, as simply denoting a certain firmness of mind, okay? Just real, just general, a firmness of mind. And then secondly, it may be taken to denote firmness only in bearing and withstanding those things wherein it is most difficult to be firm, namely certain grave dangers. He quotes Tully. Tully says, fortitude is deliberately facing dangers and bearing toils, 
right? So as he develops his thinking here, he's going to say it's almost like what you, in your soul, doing what brave people do with their bodies. Just like it, it, with your body, if there's an obstacle between you and the end goal, you physically remove that obstacle by engaging it. So in your spirit, you have obstacles towards you obeying reason and you need to face those obstacles in reality and in real time. To do that, you need the strength of the spirit that's called fortitude. So fortitude resides in the will and its chief action is one of enduring. Isn't that amazing? The ability to suffer, to endure, is the sign of fortitude. It does have another action, which is that of attacking, right? So, but that's a secondary action. And between the two, you have the same thing in common. I have a goal that I know I need to achieve, and there are obstacles to me achieving that that make me afraid. Right? There are things that I'm going to suffer if I actually follow Christ, if I, if, I, if I implement my thoughts and if I really try to move us in the right direction, I could in fact suffer consequences that are negative towards my body, ne negative towards my psychology, negative towards my emotions. But profoundly, I know that they're the right thing to do, which means that my course towards my fulfillment and me actually being good is marked along the way by threats of, uh, at the lower levels of who I am. If I'm going to, in other words, be good, well, I know that I need to parent my children effectively. Ah, yes, but that means that I might have difficult nights where we, we have to enter into conflict because my child won't necessarily obey me automatically. And I don't want to have those difficult nights, right? Because if I do, that means that then it's unpleasant. It's difficult to parent effectively. My kids are going to rebel. They're going to go through all kinds of things. And so I'm going to instead not parent or parent in, in a way that's ineffectual because I don't want to endure the difficulty that, that, that that's going to encounter. I get it that that's hard. It's hard to parent. It's also hard to lead in a workplace environment. Maybe you really like someone at a personal level, but they're misbehaving and causing difficulties for others on the team. Uh, maybe people are coming in late every day to work and you just don't want to confront that situation. Maybe an inflationary environment is prevailing and it needs you to redo your financial plans. And you say, I really don't want to go through all of that again. There's a lot of things that stand between a leader and the good that they have been entrusted to lead their people to. And all of those obstacles to face them, be it by endurance or by attacking, why, it's going to cost you something, right? No, and are you willing to pay that price? Well, if you are willing to pay the price, then you need the virtue of fortitude to carry you through as in fact you endure that pain or that you, you apply that attack that you know is necessary in order to get you to that goal. It is really hard in many ways for us to accept that as a leader. It's really hard to lead. And that's why so few people do it. But I want you to think for a second about the glory that's laid up for you on the other end. Wouldn't it be amazing to come to the end of your life having be, being able to say like St. Paul, I have fought the fight. I have run the race. I have kept the faith. Wouldn't it be amazing at the end of your life to have your children say, my father was a good man. And then my father taught me how to really live. What, what, isn't it worth all of the little things that you have to endure to be able to go back to your creator and say, you put me on this earth for a mission and I have done everything I could in your service. I mean, of course it's worth it. And that's what St. Thomas Aquinas will say. It's like, it's like that immortal line from Rocky Balboa who says, keep your eyes on the prize, right? Keep your eyes on the prize. 
And that's exactly what we need to do as servants of the Most High God and as leaders of our fellow human beings. Keep your eyes on the prize. I'm not in leadership, in other words, for myself to be gratified thereby. I'm in leadership as an act of service. And the most foundational act of service that I can render as a leader is the, to keep my focus on what is truly good and then to either attack the obstacles in my way or endure their influence on my life, but to get rid of the fear that is keeping me at bay. The thing that paralyzes us more than anything else is a fear, a fear of the physical, emotional, financial hurts that we will have to endure if we continue to do what is good. Yes, well, but the fact is, by not doing what's good, we endure a, a greater negative consequence than any kind of suffering that we endure along the way because we don't steer the ship to port. We don't arrive at our final goal. I am a leader in order to bring the authentic development and advancement of my team about. I'm not a leader in order to be comfortable, right? Well, it's not going to be comfortable if I'm really parenting, if I'm really leading my family, if I'm really leading my business. It's not going to be comfortable. But I'm here as an act of service because I know that if my company, my group, the group that I'm leading achieves the end for which it was made or constituted, that I will have done my duty and happiness in one way or another will ensue. I don't think there's any other way to say it. Leadership is for the brave. And that's why we need the virtue of fortitude. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at info at stjohninstitute.org. That's info at stjohninstitute.org. And don't forget to subscribe to premium video content to form, unite, and inspire you at Eagle Eye Pro on our website, eagleeyeministries.org. That's eagleeyeministries.org.